The Lord is the strength of his people, a saving refuge for the one he has anointed. Save your people, Lord, and bless your heritage and govern them forever. Psalm 28, verses 8 and 9. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. As we begin to celebrate these sacred mysteries, um, we just recognize that, I, we say this almost every Mass, but one of the things we just need to remind uh, you of is that um, this Mass is offered for you, that every time we offer the Mass, it is a glimpse into heaven. Every time we offer the Mass, it is, we're asking the, the, the graces and the blessings that are happening always and eternally in heaven to come and meet us. And so please know that this Mass is offered for you, and please know that um, our prayers are with you, that especially if you feel in this season incredibly alone, feel incredibly isolated, and feel um, that there's no one there, we are praying for you, and we are praying now with you. So we call upon the Lord and ask not only for uh, that he is glorified, that, that he is blessed, not for his, ask for his blessings, but we also, also ask for his mercy. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to seek and to save the lost. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. You live to intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. And on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we may always revere and love your holy name. For you never deprive of your guidance those you set firm on the foundation of your love. Through our Lord, Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear from God's word. A reading from the book of Job. The Lord addressed Job out of the storm and said, Who shut within doors the sea when it bursts forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling, swaddling bands, when I set limits for it and fastened the bar of its door and said, Thus far shall you come no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stilled. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, his love is everlasting. Give, Give thanks, thanks to the Lord, Lord his, his love, love is, is everlasting. everlasting. They who sailed the sea in ships, trading on the deep waters, these saw the works of the Lord and his wonders in the abyss. Give thanks to the Lord, his love is everlasting. His command raised up a storm wind, which tossed its waves on high. They mounted up to heaven, they sank to the depths. Their hearts melted away in their plight. Give thanks to the Lord, his love is everlasting. They cried to the Lord in their distress. 
From their straits, he rescued them. He hushed the storm to a gentle breeze, and the billows of the sea were stilled. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love is everlasting. They rejoiced that they were calmed, and he brought them to their desired heaven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his kindness and his wondrous deeds to the children of men. Give thanks to the Lord, his love is everlasting. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the love of Christ impels us. Once we have come to the conviction that one died for all, therefore all have died. He indeed died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Consequently, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. Even if we once knew Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him so no longer. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, as evening drew near, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us cross to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took Jesus with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with them. A violent squall came up, and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already filling up. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. They woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, rebuked the wind and the sea, and said, Be quiet, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? They were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who is this then, whom even the wind and the sea obey? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I should have a seat. So um, a number of months ago, during Lent, we did a series, and the series was based off of this book called He Leadeth Me. You probably know this already. Um, Father Walter Chizek, like his story of being a, a Catholic priest who had been, he became a, Je a Jesuit missionary to Russia, was captured in Russia, was interrogated, solitary confinement, lived in the gulag, all these things. It was incredible. One of the themes, though, of the, of the whole story is the theme of surrender. And so the reason I'm bringing it up now here in the middle of summer is uh, like so many years, so years, so many months after uh, Lent is over is because a lot of people journeyed with Father Walter and they're like, this is great. I love this. I love the idea of surrender. I have no idea how to do it. And I think it's probably a lot of us, right? This sense of like, oh no, that's great. I, I want to be a saint like Father Walter. I want to be a saint like all the other saints. And one of the common commonalities, one of the common factors, the, the common denominators of almost all these saints, all of these saints is I surrender. So the big question is, how do you do that? <laughs> in fact, you can look at this, the first reading, Job. Question, here's Job, the righteous man in scripture, right? The righteous man in the Old Testament. How does Job surrender? Or even the apostles in the boat today. Um, how did they, Jesus told them, get in the boat. They got in the boat, went into a storm. How did they surrender? And I have to, we have to, uh, right off the bat, right out of the gate, have to remi remember that surrender is not the same thing as giving up. So one of my least favorite country songs, and I have a lot of least favorite country songs. <laughs> now, I do like country. Country's great. <laughs> but one of my least favorite country songs is by a wonderful artist. Her name is Carrie Underwood. Everyone loves Carrie Underwood. My niece loves Carrie Underwood, and so I hesitate to even say this. But Carrie Underwood has a song that, this, in her early career, Talking about this mom driving with her baby in the back, driving to her mom and dad's house on Christmas Eve, hits the, you know, you know the song? You guys, so she hits, hits some ice and starts spinning around and the, the car starts spinning. So then the next line is, so what's she do? And so, she takes her hands off of the wheel, 
throws him in the air and says, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> so annoying. <laughs> because that's what you think. Like, and that's the whole song. Yeah, no, that's great. That's what a great prayer. Jesus, take the wheel. Like, no, 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 no. You guys, that's not a good way to drive. <laughs> it's not a good way to pray. <laughs> so the, a better way that would do this is, you probably know the story of, of Captain Sully, you know, Captain Sullivan, who, who landed the plane in the Hudson. So he, Captain uh, Sully, or Sully, right? He, um, he was a, he's a Christian. He's a man of uh, deep faith. He's a man of prayer. And at one point, after he had landed the plane in the Hudson, you know, saving hundreds of lives, they asked him, like, so did you just, you, you, how did you rely on your faith to, like, land this plane in the Hudson River and save all these lives? And he said, okay, three things happened. Number one, I realized something was wrong. Number two, I prayed to the Lord, God help me. And number three, I got to work. I mean, that's surrender. We have to understand this. I realized something's wrong. I said a prayer, God help me. And then I got to work. Surrender is not giving up. Surrender is something completely different. It is not taking your hands off the wheel and saying, Jesus, you drive my car. It is giving access. Surrender is not giving up. Surrender is giving access. So how do I know that I'm giving God access? How do I surrender? So the first couple things. First thing is this. Surrender is not a one-time thing. Surrender is not a, a set it and forget it. There's no such thing as a crockpot Christianity, like where you just kind of, again, set it and forget it and just let it. Surrender is like balance. So everyone talked about like, oh, I want work-life balance, or I, I want balance between my studies, our students, like I want balance between my studies and my social life and my sports, all these kind of things. You can never have balance. This is really, we have to understand this. No one has balance. Even the people who have balance, they don't have balance. They're balancing, which is very different than having balance. Having balance, we imagine, is like, okay, you're on one foot and just like, boom, done. I, I got into position, now I'm just on one foot, I'm balanced. But if you've ever gone on one foot, you're never balanced, you're constantly balancing. So you're constantly making these little adjustments. Sometimes something big comes along, you have to make a big adjustment. But no one's ever balanced. We're always, always balancing. Same thing when it comes to surrender. No one's ever just, oh, I'm surrendered now. It's a matter of, no, I'm constantly surrendering. Why? Because life keeps happening to us. And as life keeps happening to us, it's like, oh, there's another thing the Lord is asking me. There's another thing. I just, he's just asking me to adjust. And so if you want to say like, no, I'm surrendered, you will never be surrendered. We will always be surrendering. And that's, and that's, that's good news. Why? Because it means that you're still alive. I guess there's one time you'll be surrendered. That's in heaven. But if you're surrendering, that means you're still alive. That means that there's still an opportunity. That means life's still coming at you. That means that there's still choices to make. There's still decisions to make. That means that you still have the opportunity to say, God, you can have this. Again, surrender is not giving up. Surrender is giving access. Saying, God, you can have this. So number one, it's an action. It's going to be ongoing. Number two, how do I know if I'm surrendered? Well, what's the opposite of surrender? Are you doing that? So with the opposite of surrender, I'm thinking of two things. Uh, the opposite, opposite of surrender is rebellion or resentment. And so you can ask, okay, am I surrendered? Well, question, are you in rebellion or are you resenting? Now, sometimes rebellion is really, really overt, right? Sometimes rebellion is that shaking the fist at the Lord and say, I defy you, God. Sometimes that's what rebellion can look like. But I would say rebellion, the kind of rebellion we have to be on guard against is a more subtle kind of rebellion. There's the kind of rebellion that, no, I'm going to reject God's word. I'm going to reject the church's teaching. But how about this? Um, how about the rebellion of God says, do this, and I do anything else? That's rebellion. Procrastination, you guys, is not a sin you necessarily need to bring to confession. You might. But if God says, do this, and I do anything else other than that, that's rebellion. If God says, here's, what I, here's, here's the next step I want you to take, and I want to take another step, and I do take another step, that's rebellion. And that does something to our hearts. That, that, in fact, that kind of posture of rebellion of just like, again, not even raising the fist to the Lord and saying, I, I defy you, I will not do this, but just kind of ignoring the Lord, it does something to our hearts. You know the book of Exodus. We know the story that God sends Moses to Pharaoh, to tell Pharaoh, let my people go so they can come worship me. What happens? Pharaoh's heart gets hardened. Pharaoh knows that this is so important for all of us. All of us, because we look at Pharaoh and think, that's ridiculous. That's the dumbest thing in the world. There's all these plagues, and Pharaoh's like, nope, I'm still not going to do this. After the first plague, I'd be like, fine, leave, go. <laughs> but what happens? It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, we have to understand this, because 
That's not the same thing as God took away Pharaoh's free will. Pharaoh always had free will. Pharaoh allowed his heart to be hardened. Because why? Because Pharaoh chose to ignore the very call of God. God said, do this thing, set my people free. And he did anything else but what God was specifically asking. That's what hardens our heart. In fact, God's not responsible for hardening Pharaoh's heart any more than, well, I say it like this. This is the analogy. Pharaoh's still free. But his heart, in our hearts, are either made of two, one of two substances. Our hearts are either made of clay, and God is like the sun, and when God is present and he tells us what he wants, our hearts become hardened. Not because the sun's bad, but because I've chosen to let my heart be clay. When I ignore what God asks me to do, I've chosen to let my heart be clay. Or our hearts can be wax. And when God's presence is there, it's like the presence of the sun that softens the wax, that melts the wax. And so the big question is this, is am I ignoring God's voice to such a degree that I'm in a place of rebellion so much so that my heart has been hardened? And again, that can be us. When I don't want to pay attention to what God is asking of me. I know what his word is, I know what his, te- his church is teaching me. I know the church teaches X, but I'm going to live as if God has never said anything about this. That's living in rebellion. I'm going to live as if God has never said anything about this. That's living in rebellion. And again, it can be so subtle. It can be so subtle that it just looks like this. It looks like staying distant from God. It looks like this. It looks like this right now is the only time you and I have talked to God or thought about God in the past week. That's actually living in rebellion. Living as if I'm hiding from the Lord. That is actually, or even this, I do go to pray, but I'm hiding the thoughts of my heart. I'm hiding the desires of my heart. I'm hiding what I actually want. I'm hiding myself. You guys, we can actually be people who pray on a regular basis, pray every single day. But if I'm actually not revealing to the Lord my thoughts, my feelings, my desires, if I'm not actually revealing to God my wounds, then I might actually be praying in a spirit of rebellion. And then this is, again, you have Pharaoh, right, who hardened his heart. Here's two other characters. Here's King Saul in the Old Testament. Or even Judas in the New Testament. Both of these men, right? King Saul, he, he had, God very clearly said through prophet Samuel, do this thing. Saul didn't do that thing. And he knew he didn't do the thing. And he felt bad about the thing because he, he was going to lose the kingship. Judas, <laughs> he was not called by Jesus to betray him. That was not a call that God had asked of him. But he did it. And afterwards, what happened? He felt badly. But what's the one thing that both King Saul and Judas failed to do? They didn't fail to feel bad. They both felt really badly. What they failed to do, they failed to surrender. Meaning, they failed to come before God once again and say, God, my heart is broken, I'm sorry. How often do we come to prayer and we talk to God about everything but the pain in our hearts? We talk to God about everything except, I'm frustrated with you, God. You guys, Job didn't do that. Job didn't hide his frustration. Job did I mean, when you say, curse the day I was born, you're not holding anything back from the Lord. I mean, when you say, it would have been better for me if I'd never seen the light of day, you're not holding much back from the Lord. When you say, God, I can't even get enough saliva to spit. This is how bad I'm feeling. This is how horrible this, this life is. Like, you're being pretty honest. You're being pretty frank. That's one of the great things is that quest we have to ask is, are, are there any thoughts, feelings, emotions, or anything that I'm not allowing God access If that's the case, I'm not surrendered. If that's the case, I'm in rebellion. So it can be that rebellion, but there also can be resentment. This is all subtle, right? Rebellion can be subtle. Resentment can be even trickier. Because resentment is is this. It's like, okay, God, no, fine. I'll do what you want, but don't expect me to like it. (laughs) God, oh, God, uh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, I'm serving you, Lord. I am going to serve you. I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do. I refuse, though. I refuse to find joy in it. I know a lot about resentment. I mean, I know a lot about resentment. I I actually, uh, I found this in my heart within the last year. Actually, almost a year ago. I was, uh, so here's what. um, I've been on campus. I finished my 19th year on our campus uh, just this last spring semester. Awesome. Praise the Lord. So good. But for those 19 years, we have been in this little this little garage. We're in a garage right now. This is a garage. Um, it has a chapel. Our Lord is here. He's present in my garage. In, no big deal. Um, 
But we haven't been able to get any bigger than this garage. There's been no land around the campus. There's been no opportunity to grow. And what happened was, praise the Lord, um, two years ago, we were able to close by the entire block that we're on here. And this door opened up that, that made what was previously impossible, it made it possible that, that, that here we are, we're, we have this little house, this little garage, and there's no, there's no place for students to come. And you guys, I, our missionaries on this campus have been amazing. What they've done with, with just reaching so many students, that we have so, students every single day who come to this chapel to come to the garage and have a holy hour, have a holy half hour, they come to mass, but there's no room for them. And so the bishop said, okay, listen, buy this land, we bought the land. He said, okay, Father Mike, now your new job is you're going to keep being the chaplain at the University of Minnesota Duluth, but you're also going to raise a bunch of money. <laughs> no, you're going to try to raise a bunch of money. <laughs> and then you who have no experience in fundraising and you have no experience in like design, you have no experience in church architecture, you have no experience like other than just doing this, living in a garage, it's your job to do all this stuff. And so it's clear that God has asked me to do this because bishop, bishops asked me to do this. And so I'm like, no problem. Okay, bishop, yes. Because I promised the bishop, you know, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Um, and I promised God, God will do whatever you ask me to do. But I'll tell you this, if you were to ask me, hey, Father Mike, how's it going? <sighs> <laughs> How, how's that fundraising? <sighs> Are you traveling again this weekend? <sighs> how the travels go? <sighs> like, you know, oh my gosh, you guys, I can talk your ear off about how... <laughs> How much? I'm like, I don't want to do this. And I, I was convicted by this. I was convicted by this because I was convinced that I'm doing God's will. God has asked me to do this. Oh, yes, Lord. But if you were to ask me, how am I doing it? I'd be doing it resentfully. Now, I believe this project. I believe we need this. I believe this is absolutely necessary. But will I put my whole heart into it? No, my heart belongs to the students. I have to leave them every time I go try to raise money. I don't like that. Last August, I was reading 2 Corinthians, our second reading today, 2 Corinthians. A little bit later in 2 Corinthians. And St. Paul is writing to people who are like me. <laughs> writing to people who are, oh, God, I'm going to do what you want, but they're going to do it in a different way than he wants. And he says this, he says, um, he says, I thought it was necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead of you and arrange in advance the gift you promised so that you so that your gift you give may be ready as a willing gift, not as an extraction or not as an exaction. I, I, I wanted them to go ahead of you because what I wanted your gift to be is I wanted your gift to be willing, not an exaction. This isn't a penalty. You're not being punished when you're asked to give. And I was like, hmm, I feel like that sometimes. I feel like this is a punishment being asked to give. He goes on to say, he says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap spar spar sparingly. Now here's how I've been living. This is maybe you too. Like, oh, I'll sow. God, you told me to sow? There. Here's a seed. Here's a two seeds. Here's three seeds. Who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And then this is the, this is the, the last sentence that I just like, oh, okay, God, I get it. He said this, each one must give, must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. One must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I was doing it, but not with a cheerful heart. I had a resentful heart. And that's the problem. You know, what is surrender? Surrender is doing what God wants, because God wants, and also as God wants. And how does he say? Do this cheerfully. But I did it with a spirit of complaint. Can we live without a spirit of complaint? Now, remember, God has asked us to access to your heart, right? So God gets to know your thoughts, feelings, desires. God gets to know if you're frustrated. God gets to know if you're like, God, I'd rather be doing something else. I mean, even Jesus approached his father with complete honesty. Job approaches, his, approaches God with complete honesty. The apostles, Lord, save us. That's honest. That's an honest prayer. But here's the problem, or the reality. Job complained, but he wasn't defined by his complaint. How often are we defined by our complaint? The apostles complained, but they weren't trapped by their complaint. Do you know anyone who's trapped by complaint? I mean, do you know anyone who is defined by complaint? I think this happens a lot. I think it happens a lot with people who are givers. I, I, I see this happening. A lot of our students go on to be nurses. A lot of our students go on to work in the medical field in other ways as well. A lot of our students go on to be teachers. And I've, I've heard from those students that some of the worst places in the world are the teacher's lounge. 
So even though they love their job, Teacher's Lounge is a place where just people just complain and complain and complain and nurses and other medical professionals love their job. They're there to serve people, but they find themselves together. And so they tell me, they just complain and complain and complain. And you realize this can happen even with people who want to give, even with people who want to live for others is I get caught in this trap of complaint. I become defined by complaint. You might have relationships with people that your relationship is based off the fact that you mutually complain with each other. So how do we escape? Like how do we escape rebellion? How do we escape resentment? How do we escape complaint? We escape <laughs> through death. How do you get surrender? The reality is through death. St. Paul makes it really, really clear. We're convinced that since one died for all, all have died. Therefore, he says, you must live no longer for yourselves. Like how in the world do I avoid that spirit of rebellion or the spirit of resentment, the spirit of complaint? How do I actually live a spirit of surrender? Is to realize I have died and a dead person doesn't care anymore about their will. A dead person doesn't care anymore. Like my life is actually, my life is no longer my life. And this is one of the, these key things, these key truths that we have to hold on to. Your life is no longer your life. If you're a Christian, your life is no longer your life. If I'm a Christian, if I'm really gonna belong to the Lord, then my life is no longer my life. I no longer can live for myself because the Holy Spirit has been given to me. So how do I get this? And this is the last thing. How do I start that? How do I walk into this? Well, there was a man way back in the day. His name was Saint Ignatius Loyola. Before he was a saint, he had a strong will. Before he was a saint, he had vision for his life. Before he was a saint, he had a very big plan for his life. And then he encountered Jesus and he realized, man, Lord, I want to surrender everything, but I've got this rebellion. I've got this resentment. I've got this complaint, but I want it to be yours. He came up with this prayer and I want to invite you to pray this prayer. This is a prayer that's worth praying every morning and every night. Because why? Because we have a spirit of rebellion that traps us. We have a spirit of complaint that can define us. We can have a spirit of resentment that can have a hold on us. But this prayer is this prayer of just surrender. It is a prayer of letting go. But it's a prayer of death. It literally is. It is a prayer that basically says, Glory God, whatever is in me that's still me, let it die. Whatever is in me that I'm holding on to and I let define me and trap me and hold on to me, Lord, let it die. And the prayer goes like this. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty. Take all my memory. Take my understanding and my entire will. Whatever I have or hold, you have given me, and I restore it all to you and surrender it wholly to be governed by your will. Give me only your love and your grace, and I'm rich enough and ask for nothing more. In our prayer today, our prayer every day, the beginning of every day and the end of every day, how do I know I'm surrendering? How do I know I'm not living in rebellion or resentment or complaint? <sighs> Have I died? Am I willing to pray that prayer? Take, O oh Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. Whatever I have or hold, you have given me. I restore it all to you and surrender it wholly to be governed by your will. Give me only your love and your grace, and I am rich enough, and ask for nothing more. Amen. I invite you to stand as we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident that God does love us and hears our prayers, we now approach him with all of our needs. That the church throughout the world may be united in prayer for the ongoing conversion of those who still do not know Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who preach and teach the word of God in our world may boldly proclaim the promise of salvation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That lawmakers may work to reflect care and compassion for the poor and vulnerable in our society. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for all creation and for all life, which comes from the Lord of the earth, the sky and the sea, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who have gone before us in death may be welcomed into the heavenly kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And since the bishop has asked us to joyfully be entered into this, this project of raising money and building a beautiful church where he can be loved and glorified and where our students can be saved and sanctified, we pray this campaign prayer together. God, our Father, you, you have made us for yourself and you have brought us to this moment. We turn away from our sins and toward your grace. We thank you for loving us in our indifference and in our great need. Bless this project with your favor. We believe that, in doing this work, we are saying yes to your will. May the seeds of faith you have planted in Duluth continue to bear fruit and become that large tree that transforms our campus and impacts the world. Bless those who support, plan, and construct this facility so that your house may be a house of prayer, a place where you are loved and glorified and your people are saved and sanctified. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine, and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all this holy church. Receive, O Lord, the sacrifice of conciliation and praise, and grant that, cleansed by its action, we may make an offering of our heart pleasing to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right to give you thanks. Truly just to give you glory, Father most holy, for you are the one God living in true, existing before all ages and abiding for all eternity, dwelling in unapproachable light. Yet you who alone are good, the source of life, have made all that is so that you might fill your creatures with blessings and bring joy to many of them by the glory of your light. And so in your presence are countless hosts of angels who serve you day and night, in gazing upon the glory of your face, glorify you without ceasing. With them, we too confess your name in exaltation, giving voice to every creature under heaven, as we acclaim, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give you praise, Father most holy, for you are great and you have fashioned all your works in wisdom and in love. You have formed man in your own image and entrusted the whole world to his care so that in serving you alone, the Creator, he might have dominion over all creatures. 
and when, through disobedience, he had lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the domain of death, for you came in mercy to the aid of all, so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offered them covenants, and through the prophets taught them to hope for salvation. And you so loved the world, Father Most Holy, that in the fullness of time you gave your only begotten Son to be our Savior. Made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he shared our human nature in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom, and to the sorrowful of heart, joy. To accomplish your plan, he gave himself up to death, but by rising from the dead, he conquered death, and he destroyed death and restored life. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us, he sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as the first fruits for those who believe, so that bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the full. Therefore, O Lord, we pray, May the same Holy Spirit graciously sanctify these offerings, that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the celebration of this great mystery which he himself left us as an eternal covenant. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father Most Holy, having loved his own in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death and his ascent to the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And as we await his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the sacrifice acceptable to you, which brings salvation to the whole world. Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church, and in your loving kindness, to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice, that we be gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, so that we may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ for the praise to the praise of your glory. Therefore, Lord, remember now all for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially for your servant Francis, our Pope, Daniel, our Bishop, the whole order of bishops, all the clergy, those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you, your entire people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. To all of us, your children, grant no merciful Father that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, and with your apostles and saints in your kingdom. There, with the whole of creation, freed from the corruption of sin and death, may we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, 
who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for my sheep, says the Lord. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 and 15. Let us pray. <clears throat> Renewed and nourished by the sacred body and precious blood of your Son, we ask of your mercy, O Lord, that what we celebrate with constant devotion may be our sure pledge of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Michael, Amen. the archangel, Amen. defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Salve Regina. Mater misericordiae, vita dulce do, et spes nostra salve. A te clamamus, exules filii eve, a te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in ac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, Advocata nostra, illos tuos, misericordes oculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesu, benedictum fructum vetris tui, nobis, os toc exilium, os tende. Oh.